everyone is talking AI regulation and everyone is literally an expert. The second sentence, which is there is so much promise for good and so much promise for harm. But I think we need to differentiate between enabling laws and disabling. If you don't understand it from a regulation perspective, then the instinct is to prohibit it. Hey everyone, so we are here back again with uh, episode two of the NTLF Conversations. But before I get into what episode two is all about, I want to say a huge thanks to everyone who watched episode one and the feedback we, that we got from all of you. It's, it's just been completely overwhelming. So what are we going to talk about today? The one thing that is pretty much on everyone's mind, uh, which is AI regulation. Everyone is it's you know it's it's amazing how this is now becoming almost a cocktail room conversation where everyone seems to be talking about it and everyone is an expert. You know, there was a very interesting article that I was reading in MIT uh, Tech uh, that that I think aptly summed it up. It said that for years, U.S. legislators and American tech companies were reluctant to introduce, if not outright against, strict technology regulation. And now both have started begging for it. So what has changed? And and how do we separate the hype from what is really needed? Because this is an incredibly important topic. So I have decided to get together a few real experts who can help us figure out what is important, what should we focus on, what shouldn't we let us distract our attention, and, and how do we go about this? So I'm tremendously happy to uh, introduce my three guests for today, three good friends, Rahul Matan, partner in Trilegal, and also the head of uh, tech, media, telecom, TMT practice in, in, in Trilegal, and for me, Rahul is the go-to guy whenever we talk about any kind of big tech policy and what changes needed. He's the man. Uh, so I'm really happy to have him join us. Jaspreet Bindra needs no introduction, the tech whisperer. And uh, one of the, I think he's one of the most passionate and uh, uh, you know, really visible voices on digital transformation, on technology. For me, he's also one of the most practical and sane voices on digital transformation and technology, usually manages to beautifully uh, cut through all the hype and get into what really matters, the dem demystification at its best. So thank you again, Jaspreet, for joining us. Really happy to have you here. And last but not the least, my guest, thrilled to welcome him on, on the podcast, is our own very um, NASCOM policy guru, Ashish Agarwal, who lives and breathes policy, lives and breathes regulation. So really happy to have all three of you here. And uh, if you guys are game, we'll get started. Sure. Absolutely. Okay. Let's go. Awesome. So Arahul, my first question is to you. Regulation is now hot. And how do you feel about it? Everybody's talking regulation. I went into some, you know, dinner, cocktail dinner, and everyone is talking AI regulation. And everyone is literally an expert. And you can see that on social media. How do you feel about this? You feel threatened a bit? Yeah. <laughs> Look, if everyone's an expert, obviously I feel threatened because I've sort of staked <laughs> my entire career on being an expert. <laughs> But look, I, I mean, forget about uh, uh, your know, tech regulation. For, for, as a lawyer, I'm a tech lawyer. And so for my entire career, which I'm, you know, I feel is at its end, uh, I've been banging the drum about how we need to regulate technology. And now at sort of the sunset of my career, I find that everyone is saying, yes, we must. Uh, and I feel I've got to sort of drag myself out for another 20 years to, to see that this is done. Uh, but yeah, look, I mean, I think... Um, uh, what's what's really beautiful about this moment is that there is so much promise, uh, and yet there is uh, uh, so. Okay, let me let me let me just say there's so much promise and put a full stop, and then uh, say the second sentence, which is there is so much promise for good and so much promise for harm, and therein lies the need uh, for uh, a very very clever approach uh, to regulation. 
and I think that's the reason why we're having all of these, uh, you know, cocktail discussions, because these are wicked problems. Uh, on the one hand, you want to get the maximum out of this opportunity, because yeah. we're almost seeing magical things happen. Yeah. Uh, you know, to have uh, machines talk back to you, to have you know, everyone in NASCOM must be terrified because uh, you're, you're worried about everyone being an expert at regulation. I'm an expert at code. I don't need to do, I, you know, I don't need to hire anyone because I just go to these generative AI things and they spit out wonderfully uh, efficient code. Um, and so, look, I mean, I think that's the beauty of this moment, uh, that there is so much promise it's dem democratizing so many things that, uh, you know, were, were big barriers. But at the same time, we're seeing just how uh, vicious some of the uh, harms yeah. can be. Yeah. Um, you know, defamation. Uh, you don't know what's right and what's wrong because there really, really is no uh, distinction uh, between right and wrong. Um, and so how do we, how do we get the value, uh, but at the same time uh, not get submerged by the harm? Uh, and that's really why this is a this is a fascinating moment. I like to think that you know all the experts who became experts over the last three months um, uh, will uh, will perhaps see some value in some of us who've spent twenty years actually thinking about uh, how these problems uh, need to be weighed. Uh, and so maybe you know I will still have some value uh, as we go on. Or, yeah, you know, who knows? Generally, I mean, give better advice on how it needs to be regulated itself. Uh, and then, you know, there, we're in a pretty pickle. So first of all, I do a lot of fact checking in these conversations. So one thing I want to completely put out there, definitely not at the sunset of your career. Let's get some facts, right? <laughs> So no, but but I'm gonna pick up on what you said um, and what 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 I think a lot about the promise, the promise of technology, almost this humanization moment that we are seeing of technology, where it is, uh, you know, what I love about it is now all of a sudden, uh, everyone, as long as you have some level of fluency in English, can do things with AI. You don't have to be a data scientist. And I think that's the tipping point. That's and 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 just breathe, I want to come to you. We we, we see the promise. And I'll 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 give a I'll narrate a incident that happened recently. We were doing a discussion with a room full of folks. There were a bunch of techies who were working on AI. Um, and there were a bunch of professors, there were a bunch of uh, CXOs from, uh, say, hospitals and banks, and we had got everyone together, small room, uh, got everyone together to just have this discussion. It was amazing to see that the techies were the ones that were most paranoid. Uh, about what can happen. And they were the ones who were really going on and on about the need for regulation, the need for us to think through. And then the academics and the uh, the, 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 the non-traditional tech companies, the digital companies were all about the promise and the need for more innovation. So break this down, what is happening and why? You know, you were talking about cocktail conversations, Devjani. And I'm traveling to Bangalore, which is the tech capital of the country, in all probability. And yesterday, I was at a dinner uh, with a few friends. And the most remarkable thing about that two hours dinner was that the word chat GPT or generative AI did not come up even once. Wow. <laughs> okay. So that to me in the last six months was the most singular thing. Otherwise, you're right. And you know, what has happened is... Uh, that this this discourse, this narrative, you know, so say Chad GPT came out, well, it, it did come out on November 30th of last year. And the first two, three months, if you saw the narrative, the press, the pundits, the experts, they were all super excited about the possibilities. And there was this positivity, you know, and there was this, wow, we were, we've kind of got something, unleashed something which is as fundamental as the internet, as the iPhone and from the pitch I said, fire, et cetera, okay. But then over the last three months, so the second half of the six month period since ChatGPT has come out, the discourse has actually changed quite a lot. And the narrative and the discourse, as you rightly said, as Rahul was saying, is now suddenly about, it's going to kill us, it's going to take our jobs. You know, we have to set up guardrails, regulate us, regulate it, regulate it. And, you know, this just swing which has happened. And I think therefore it's good to, Kind of go back to the positives, like you said, you know, that there's some stuff which can really do, you know, uh, which can really change. Uh, you know, uh, I, I 
Well, I I don't know if you know that, but I'm in my late middle age doing my second master's in Cambridge University on AI and ethics. And this comes up quite a lot. And, and, and one of the things which I wrote a paper about there actually was how this is similar to nuclear energy. And now that course is coming up quite a lot. I'm very proud of it. Mm. Okay, Sam Ortman is talking about it, etc. And, you know, the thing with nuclear energy is we... We were very excited. Then Hiroshima happened. We got very scared. We started yeah. controlling it. And you know, one of the unintended side effects was that no clean power got produced. Okay. And no nuclear reactors happened with clean energy and global yeah. warming. Yeah. Okay. And we could have probably staved off global warming if we had focused on the positive aspect of, of nuclear energy. And I think the same is true. Here, it's as fundamental. It can probably help us solve climate change. It can probably help us uh, with nuclear fusion, which could solve for energy. Uh, and, and, you know, sure, it'll write software sometimes better than us. It'll, you know, produce ideas which could help us. All of those things are there, which I'm sure we'll talk about. But I think it's these big, massive things which humanity has not been able to solve, but probably a parallel intelligence. I'm not saying a super intelligence, but a parallel intelligence can help us solve to me, is the biggest, uh, um, uh, you know, positive out there, the biggest thrill out there. We can get into specific use cases later, but this is really the promise uh, if we look at the positive side of this uh, equation. So, uh, Justin, I think you are talking about the positives and, and, and when you talk about this nuclear bomb going off stuff, I mean, definitely, you know, it, uh, when you think about technology like that, it put a freeze into everybody when you think of the development of the technology thereafter. But when you look at artificial intelligence, and, and to Raoul also to your point, right? if you look at last at least 20, 30 years, what are the two technologies that came out? Probably I would say blockchain and now AI. And, and what, what happens is that typically, if you don't understand it from a regulation perspective, then the instinct is to prohibit it or to come out with a, a laundry list of regulations at the start. So in a lot of conversation, at least, where I am seeing this, I get a sense that it's as if uh, uh, there is no regulation at all. Uh, but that's not true, right? We have a whole set of regulation around when we look at uh, uh, use of computer resources or consumer protection, or even uh, when we talk about these uh, uh, harms around misinformation and biases. The, the larger thing which I think get missed in all this conversation is that the focus has to be so much on building capacity and capability to understand and enforce something. And I think that's where there'll be a big gap, right? So is this entire focus on or getting caught up in this Brussels effect of regulation in a way deflecting the conversation from saying that when these harms actually happen, uh, what is our capability to even use existing laws to deal with it? Uh, uh, I don't see enough conversations on that. No, so, yeah, so look, I mean, I... Sorry, go ahead, Rav. <laughs> Yeah, right. so look, this is this this happens all the time, right? So um, we have wonderful general laws that apply to pretty much anything that you want to throw at them. Um, but still, we I wrote an article once. I said we uh, it was called the law of the horse. I think so. You know, you, you have harms that are sorry. What was it called? You have to, you will have to dig into the archives. But it was called the law of the horse. Okay. So horse. you know, when horses cause harms, uh, ah. we feel that we need to regulate horses. But yes. actually, the harm that a horse is causing is just basically a regular tort, right? It bangs into something, it destroys property. Now, you need to go back to the law of tort, which says that if someone breaks someone else's property, this is how you must be punished. You don't need to create a new law of the horse for when the horse breaks something. Now, we are creating a law of AI when actually whatever AI breaks, we have existing laws uh, to fix. But actually, actually, that's not the real problem because, you know, of course, we've got uh, specific uh, laws that will address certain things. I think the more pernicious thing is actually uh, sort of something what just uh, along the lines of what just was saying as well. Uh, some of the laws that we have right now could prevent us from getting the advantage that AI uh, provides. And if you take a look at copyright law, for example, right, we're having this huge problem with generative AI, particularly yeah. the image AI, uh, coming up against copyright law. And I think Japan came into the news because uh, it recently said, um, I, you know, I think it's recently reset because they've had this position for some time. 
yeah, uh, to say essentially that, look, we're not going to use the same uh, provisions of copyright law when it comes to training, uh, yeah. using copyright information to train models. And I think we have to start thinking along those lines. Let's take a look at what are the restrictions that that this wonderful new technology uh, could face because uh, we've had laws in place that were designed for a completely different purpose. But if you look now at how they apply here, they're going to completely throttle uh, what this regulation, uh, you know, what this new technology can do. But at the same time, you know, we can't uh, uh, just completely ride roughshod over intellectual property. So this is once again the reason why you need to take a new lens at some of these things, uh, figure out what the opportunities are, and then try and find that balance to try and you know, thread the needle, as it were, between these two uh, extremes. So, Ashish, I, I agree we shouldn't be doing a law of AI just to cover all the things that are already covered. And I think that's our instinct. We are, no matter how much a lot of us say we have to, uh, some of the pressures, you know, Devjani, you and Ashish know how the pressures come. Uh, something happens and they say, okay, let's stop it. And so let's ban it or something like that. I hope we don't ever get to the point where someone says something happens, let's ban all of AI uh, in the way that Italy did for chat GPT. But you know, you know how these things happen. But uh, at least let's hope that those are sort of mild side effects. Let's certainly spend the time and effort to try and navigate these uh, new areas where uh, you know existing regulation could prevent us from getting all the value that we need to get out of this. Yeah, man. You bring in a very, very important point and a very important lens, which I don't think uh, most people sort of uh, understand or think about it, that when you talk regulation, it's not just for the harm. When you talk regulation, you also need to look at it from the lens of is our legal system, is our legal framework set up to unleash the potential of AI to the best possible? And I think that is something that is getting missed out from a lot of conversations. So I want to touch on two things. First, uh, you know, Rahul, Ashish, just three, all three of you, you I mean, you're, you're seeing what's happening around the world. U.S. is, is talking a lot about regulation. U.K. has, EU has announced their AI Act or planning to, uh, U.K. is talking about it. Uh, uh, I know. China it is, was the first, actually. Yes, yes. China has already started work. Uh, what are some of the key learnings, if you if you guys want to call that out, from, from what you're seeing happening around the globe, good or bad? So, sure. Let me take a stab at it, uh, Devjani, and please jump in, uh, whoever wants to. You know, I think it's interesting. I mean, and one of the things, just to go back to Rahul Mathan, and, you know, Rahul and Ashish are experts at this. I'm not. But I think we need to differentiate between enabling laws and disabling laws. You know, and enabling regulation and disabling regulation, not laws in that sense. And I think perhaps what is happening with this whole brouhaha around uh, Terminator AI uh, driving the human species extinct is that, uh, you know, uh, for some reason, the lens seems to be focused on disabling laws, okay, uh, regulation rather than enabling regulation. And if you kind of look around, as, to come to what you said, uh, Devjani, uh, you know, if you think of the, if China, China was actually the first out of the gates from a generative AI uh, uh, standpoint. And uh, uh, obviously, uh, and they have kind of put some, you know, they have said that the data itself, which generative AI is trained on, in fact, they call it something else. They call it synthetic technology. Synthetic or something. No, yes, yeah, uh, synthesized technology, not synthetic data as much. But anyway, what this is trained on, that itself needs to be, approved okay and um, so you know they are coming from this view therefore obviously great wall of china etc etc so that if you know if garbage doesn't go in garbage will not come up okay, in that sense so you know that's their largely framework and a few other things eu is trying to adapt its existing ai laws to generative ai and so they have a use case based law of minimal risk to exceptional risk which i'm sure Ashish Rahul will know much better about. And they're trying to say that, look, where will this come in? And a lot of generative AI is coming in the high-end exceptional risk. And uh, 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 Sam Altman and OpenAI have threatened to walk out of the EU, basically, because this, and there's a huge amount of copyright stuff there, et cetera. US, as expected, taking more a laissez-faire approach. Okay, California, in fact, has come out with a uh, law, but the U.S. still, our regulation, but uh, the U.S. still hasn't. And U.K. is trying to kind of regain its past glory by saying that, you know what, we're going to get the perfect law. We'll kind of mix all those three together 
and get something which you know is no not either on that side or either on this side but my meta point is that still especially the u china definitely uh, uh california are still looking at disabling regulation how do we prevent tax how do we prevent why not looking at how do we encourage x and encourage y and i think both of these yeah, it's, it's risk led it's absolutely risk led rahul, uh, sorry i just to finish Raul and then Ashish shall come to you. Raul, your key takeaways from what's happening around the world? Yeah, so similar. I look, I'm not going to contradict anything that Jaspeet says. I think it's that's a that's a good summary of um, uh, the way in which the rest of the world is thinking about it. But look, I, I think we're in a at a at a sort of a peculiar uh, point in time. Uh, let's just take uh, say uh, Europe's uh, point of view because you know as much as China may want to uh, take care of the training uh, data. Uh, we all know that it is possible for China to just put all sorts of things into the trading data if it wants, and you know none of us can really see it. But let's just take the the European point of view. Look, we're at a we're at a place where um, we've got a global uh, community, and any country uh, that is going to say, "Look, we are going to uh, restrict the development of yeah. certain types of technology because it is high risk and exceptional risk." Uh, they're going to uh, essentially say that, uh, look, we're going to just hobble ourselves. Um, the others can race, but we're going to just hobble ourselves. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I can only think that that sort of an approach uh, is going to result in them being left behind. Uh, and we should not be the ones uh, to be left behind. Because let's be completely clear, uh, this sort of development is going to happen. The moment uh, GPT was released as chat GPT for free and everyone could see how it was being used. And the moment you know, it became really easy for anyone to buy a GPT for subscription. Uh, and the moment everyone can get on a mid journey, complete, you know, I'm all in on uh, AI. Uh, it is part of my workflow. Just with and I share a column. I mean, we, we both are columnists in the mint. Uh, and uh, I'm telling you, none of you know uh, how much AI has been part of my articles for the last six months, but it has been an integral part of my articles. And that's really the power uh, of AI. But the point I'm trying to make is that as people try to restrict uh, the, you know, the development and the use of AI, at exactly the same time, other countries are allowing it to uh, exponentially grow without restriction. And of course, harms will be caused. But there are goods that are, uh, you know, there are benefits that are coming out of it. And as we uh, constrain it more, we also constrain our ability to get uh, the good out of it. And since this is uh, happening globally, uh, we're going to see uh, differences between countries very, very quickly. And I, yeah, I think, uh, at least for India, I sincerely hope that we uh, uh, find this balance properly uh, so that we aren't uh, the ones who are left behind. Uh, as the whole world uh, races ahead. You know, the point you made is something I worry a lot about, Rahul, which is one country's regulation will become another country's competitive advantage in this in these world. And, and Ashish, I'm going to come to you. I, I know you are also talking a lot to industry also in terms of what uh, what the regulation roadmap is going to be. Uh, what are some of the worries that you are picking up? And also talk a little bit about, uh, you know, are, are people starting to say that development should not be regulated, but commercialization or products and services should be regulated. So what are some of the key things that you are picking up there? So one thing I think we did uh, a few discussions and, uh, and we had a lot of conversation with the companies and their CISOs. I think uh, one area of clear worry is around cybersecurity that uh, what it means in terms of harms that can happen because now pretty much you don't need to be an expert at hacking or, or you know, in computer technology to do that. These tools can be available to everybody. And then therefore what it means from, not only just from a point of view of overall critical infrastructure in the country, but also just in terms of IT companies, you know, and, and industry at large, by IT companies. So I think that is, uh, is a serious problem and companies are working on this. They are onto it to say that what we need to do internally to fix some of this. In terms of development, I think one of the first things is to say that, okay, fine, uh, uh, there is this huge opportunity, right? So Raul, I think uh, you initially 
uh, talked about uh, coders being worried, but I think uh, coders are also looking at to say that you no, know, there is a probably three x opportunity for them if they can boost their productivity yeah. and do so much more. So when you're thinking like that, then I think uh, the the immediate question is that are there areas in laws and policies where there is some uncertainty, and that's where just be what you said about disabling laws and enabling laws, I think becomes very relevant. So uh, one of the first thing is that. Uh, and uh, not only just co copyright law, which is a, at least a law which we have had for some time. So, you know, we know what is there and, and we can probably think of fixing it. But something like data protection, which we saw what EU went through recently with their five-year-old or eight-year-old GDPR and our own law coming in, uh, will it uh, make sure that it actually enables AI use cases? Uh, and, and that is something which uh, probably in the next few months we will see down the line. Similarly, when we look at you know reforming our IT Act, then can we look at uh, making sure that for us it becomes a competitive advantage in terms of how we are able to leverage this technology? So I think uh, there is a bit of a great opportunity there. And if I if I can just add in terms of you know when when we look at uh, uh, the EU regulations and stuff like that, so it's interesting to see how even EU over the last six months quickly realized that. It, what it has been thinking in terms of last two years is not going to work. And I think they got pretty lucky that the AI Act actually didn't come into force and they were able to now bring in some level of flexibility. So in some ways, probably EU is the only place where uh, laws are uh, uh, going ahead of the technology in some sense, right? And, and which is a huge risk. So from a uh, from an India perspective, I think uh, we are in a good place. Uh, to be observing some of the global developments and, and a lot of our tech industries actually participating in these conversations, in, whether it's in Europe, US, Europe, or Japan. And I think that kind of being able to watch those developments and pick what is useful and what is not, and then think about India advantage, I think that's a great place. And I think uh, that is something which is very interesting for us to leverage. So I'm going to shift yeah. gear a little bit to a debate that's currently going on. And there are they're very two strong sides, both sides believe they're right, right? Rahul, I want your perspective first, and then Jaspreet, I'm gonna to come to you on this same thing. So one side believes that Altman and people like Altman, Sam Altman are the hero right now. They are talking regulation, they are doing all the right things and it's becoming the poster child. And the other side believes that this is a deflection strategy. This is happening to uh, because government, we go and tell government we want regulation and it's going to take them years and years to figure out what to regulate, how to regulate. But this is a way to say you go focus on that and don't focus on what's happening right now. Right. And, and, and I think both sides are equally passionate about their point of views. And I, I, I honestly don't know which, which side is right. There's merit to both arguments. Would love to hear your perspective uh, on uh, whether you think, you know, the CEOs who are calling for regulation um, is the right thing to do uh, or is it is it a sort of a deflection strategy to buy time? Look, uh, some, some, some of these are clients of mine, so I have to be very careful how I answer this uh, question since you said CEOs. Uh, but look, I, when, when, someone, when someone says, regulate me, uh, you have to wonder why they're saying that. Because yeah. uh, no one wants to be regulated if you're a business. Um, and so what's the... What's the reason behind it? If you if you want to be slightly cynical, you've got to be slightly cynical, at least, about it. So there's no doubt that uh, this is a new area uh, and that we're going to need to do something uh, about this. Um, but, you know, when people sort of put themselves up and say, regulate me, I, I would always question it. Uh, and so let's just think through why uh, these, uh, you know, AI CEOs are asking uh, for regulation. Uh, a lot of them say that uh, the technology that we're building, some of the things that, that we're building are dangerous. Yeah. Uh, and I think the, the sort of um, subtext is that we are uh, building it in an ethical way, um, but uh, it is certainly possible now that the genie is out of the bottle that others uh, may be less ethical. Yes. Uh, and uh, so there is a need uh, to regulate uh, this ecosystem. And look, I, I am not faulting anyone's ethics and I'm not faulting uh, uh, yeah. anyone's approach yeah. to all of this. But I, I, you know, I would just say that 
um, I have no problems with that. But the, the the real risk with all of this is that uh, some of the first movers uh, will be able to uh, assume a first mover advantage uh, because no matter no matter what happens, the regulation that comes is going to be at least minimally permissive. Uh, we're not going to see a regulation, and certainly none of the AI CEOs are going to see a regulation that bans AI. They yeah. want a regulation that looks for responsible AI. And if you are going down the path of responsible AI, you're likely to get some sort of a, I don't know, for want of a better word, say licensing regime. And who is likely to get a license? All the people who are standing up and saying, see how ethically I'm performing, and who are going to really have to struggle to get the license? Uh, all of those who haven't yet been created. The you know, all the entrance. startups in India that are looking to, you know, build their own large language model, um, they're going to sort of struggle because I think there's going to be some sort of a threshold um, uh, before you get a license. So, I, I mean, I'm, once again, I don't want to attribute any motives to anyone, but I think that as we come up with this regulatory framework, we've got to be mindful of these sorts of subtexts in the language. Um, and when people are standing up and saying, handcuff me, uh, we've got to recognize that no one does that. Uh, and if they're doing that, there's probably some sort of a long-term game involved uh, in this, which is not to say that we shouldn't be thinking about regulation at all. Uh, no, and no, so I think we really should divorce yeah. these two um, yes. and, and sort of understand what's playing out in the uh, congressional hearings in the US. Um, you know, I, I was listening to uh, a, um, I think it was a, uh, the daily podcast straight after this. Uh, and a lot of this came out, you know, in all the previous big tech congressional hearings, it's been antagonistic. It's been, you know, people literally yeah. getting uh, borderline abusive with the with the tech CEOs who they've got there and actually doing a shoddy job of it. But here now, both on the on the side of the questioners, as well as the people being questioned, it was a very, very engaging, you know, let's all in, educate ourselves about this. Um, and it was, it's a shift. Uh, and I think there are two reasons for that. One is that this we're doing this right at the beginning. So at the very least, I'm going to give all the AI CEOs full marks uh, for uh, an excellent PR strategy. You know, go up front before you create any real harm. Uh, and then, you know, you have a better time of it at the, before the Congress. Uh, but also, you know, I think the, the uh, lawmakers around the world are much more alert to the risk than they were in the previous uh, regime of technology where they just sort of slept on it. And then we've, you know, all of us, all of us sitting here have had to fight an uphill battle. Um, so I'm actually quite optimistic about the situation. Uh, I, you know, I, I think I've deviated from your question, uh, Dejani, but I think that just from a formulating policy, we're in a much better place right now. We're, we're all engaging. And I think as long as all of us are wise to the, you know, the second and the third uh, 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 steps on the chessboard, uh, yeah. we're not going to let people fool us into sacrificing our queen too early on uh, in the chess game. No, I think that's a that's an excellent uh, point of view, Raul, and very balanced in terms of how we should look at this. And I completely agree with you. We are in a good place. Just breathe. I want you to also adding to what Rahul said. There's another angle I want you to think about and you know talk a little bit about, which is the ask for uh, a third party agency, if you may, mm. to regulate. Right. right now, that's, that's a very interesting problem. one because. Uh, uh, you can always, I mean, I was reading somewhere where it says you can always set up an agency, but um, how do you enforce and how do you get that agency to do its job? That's a completely different story, right? How do you build capabilities within the agency? So again, uh, what's the merit in asking for these agencies? I mean, is there a good reason or, or do you think uh, there's another way we should be approaching this? Cool. Let me just answer this in two parts, uh, Devjani. The first one, taking off from Rahul, what Rahul said. I don't know if you read the, uh, there's a very long blog from uh, Mark Anderson. Yes, yes. Just before. yes. And he talks about the Baptists and the bootleggers. Yes. In all this regulation thing. And Baptists are the one who really believe in the good of it, right? And then there are the bootleggers who are actually looking to profit out of it. And, you know, and this happened with the banking crisis, you know, some people really wanted big, you know, small banks to happen. So others were like, you know what, if I kind of play this right, the big banks will get bigger and the bootleggers won. And his assertion is that in most of these battles, the bootleggers usually win over the Baptists. Okay. And therefore, in this case too, I think we are seeing a lot of bootlegging going on. 
okay, where people are going to saying that, look, let me just get ahead right up front so that I can shape stuff rather than be a uh, be a victim of the stuff. But in all of this, there are some Baptists around too, mostly from the universities, okay, and the academics, etc., who are kind of, uh, you know, shocked by some of the things which could happen. Not as much from a super intelligent standpoint, but much more from a bias and, you know, uh, uh, discrimination, etc., etc., standpoint. And that kind of brings us, therefore, to, you know, this, this question that you said that, look, okay, fine, there's a regulation, but should it be country level, global body, different body, etc. And, you know, I wanted to actually provoke this a little earlier when we were talking about, oh, you will do this, US will do this in India, we should do something else. Look, this technology is borderless. You know, in my view, I mean, if India has certain laws and you have, I mean, you can probably work within those laws in India, but tomorrow if you have to go with your product to the, the EU or to China or to other places, you might have to look at totally different and what you've built here might just not, you know, will be totally useless there. And therefore, does it even as a provocative statement, again, the legal people here are better, better equipped to answer this, even make sense to look at a country by country, by country regulation of this because this is borderless. How are we going to regulate this? And that's where, you know, that's where it comes to this concept of a global regulation for all its ills. Look, going back to nuclear uh, uh, technologies and Hiroshima. By the way, in this Hiroshima G7 conference, only three topics were discussed, Ukraine, China, and AI. AI. It was very significant that we are talking about this in Hiroshima. Because Hiroshima is what made IAEA happen, the Internet Atomic Energy yes. Agency. Yes. And the NPR, the non-proliferation. And lots of problems created haves and have-nots and all of that thing. But you know what? Touch wood, we haven't had a nuclear war since then. And so is there a way we want to look at that as an inspiration, not as a framework, but an inspiration to look at a global regulatory regime? I know the world is fractured geopolitically. It's not going to be that simple. But I think we might be just spending a lot of time creating countrywide regulation to what effect. And I think, therefore, this need to, that's why probably the G7, et cetera, et cetera, maybe the G20, which I know you're working on, Okay, and that's where I think we need to have this multilateral through some global body. IA is one um, inspiration, as I said, not a model. There are a few others. There's CERN, for example, you know, the uh, uh, the the Higgs boson, the God particle, you know, bunches of people working together on one technology across countries, mostly for good, and then letting it out when, you know, it's done. So I think it, there's merit to think of a global model for all its sales. Rahul and Ashish, I would love to get your take on that. So Will I, it doesn't even work. <laughs> I was just listening to uh, Jaspreet and, and it's a very commendable thought, Jaspreet. I think, but trying uh, to... Get... I don't like that commendable. I like <laughs> <laughs> the backhanded ones. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> There's a but. And I think the but is what, yeah. is, what you're worried yeah, about. The but is bigger than the commendable here. But anyway, Ashish. <laughs> Getting EU, US, Japan, India, let us say, because everybody has their national interest. China? Or, or I was just going to ask that. How do you fit in China? <laughs> and, and China, you want to get them in the room? Uh, okay, good. Nice. But to Devin, your point, you know, each country's policies or uh, 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 strategies can be uh, other countries' uh, competitive advantage or disadvantage. So having said that, I think it's going to be a huge challenge, but it is, it's a problem worth solving. Uh, and, and worth attempting, and, and definitely that's where the push should be. Uh, and to the point that, you know, when you talk about creating a new agency, which is, in, in my mind, at least a little more straightforward problem, because uh, one, this very idea that something which has worked in a tangible world in terms of, you know, when we talk about nuclear technology in a certain ecosystem, or when you talk about even drug regulation, uh, and lifting and shifting that to apply to an AI construct, I think it is the, the idea that uh, AI is a dual use technology, just like nuclear is very good, but that's where the idea stops being, uh, the analogy stops being, you know, uh, actually workable. So in an AI construct, uh, when you think about a, a new agency, it, it sounds like sometimes like a red herring where you do that and you go down that path and then you are staring at uh, how do you really make it work and be successful. 
So uh, just please, I think it's worth attempting how we get to a level of semblance uh, at a global level in terms of some harmonized thinking. And the challenge will be, I think we can get to a level where we talk about some design principles at a higher level. But beyond that, to translate that into something which is going to be a serious uh, regulatory framework, I think that is something interesting and we will have to see how that uh, can come about. Rahul, your take on it and also if you see the global agencies currently, I'm not, we don't need to name any, but effectiveness is a big question. Uh, ability to really enforce, making a law is easy, but then enforcing a law is is where the, the real work is. So your take? Yeah, no, so I think I think a, a little similar, uh, but I'm going to sort of uh, do a twist uh, towards the end. Um, in in today's geopolitical uh, scenario, um, you know, with, uh, you know, the, just sort of the China issue, um, and then, you know, we've got Russia and Ukraine. And so there's a lot of fault lines uh, in the world today. Uh, and all of these uh, countries that are arrayed on different sides of the fault line are the countries uh, that are going to have to come together. Uh, in this new uh, global agency, and so in that context, I think it's really challenging. But then yeah. I, you know, I want to just take Jasprit's point um, on on nuclear and and Hiroshima, uh, and say that uh, uh, the one thing that we haven't really talked about so far, even though uh, Jasprit hinted at it right in the beginning, is um, artificial general intelligence and yes. Terminator and all of these concerns. Right now, we've got to recognize that uh, Jeffrey Hinton, who uh, has for a long time worked in Google, resigned such that uh, he could yes. speak more freely about the the worries uh, of AI. Uh, we've got to recognize that uh, hidden within Bing is Sydney, uh, and Sydney is a completely different personality that is contained inside uh, a general intelligence. And, that, loves, uh, and loves New York Times reporters. I was just going to say, I was just going to say, there was just about to break the marriage of a New York Times reporter uh, who couldn't sleep according to what he says that night um, because it was Valentine's Day uh, or night and he just finished a lovely uh, romantic dinner uh, with his partner and then this AI that he was chatting with uh, for probably three hours uh, tried to break up his marriage. Uh, and then there are all sorts of things like this. And uh, we've got some very, very serious people. Uh, and uh, I think maybe even a neighbor just with, uh, in the Oxford, Cambridge region, uh, Nick Bostrom, who many years ago uh, has uh, pointed this out as an issue. Uh, and I think uh, the real, the real, uh, you know, I, I'm not a, from what I see of AI right now, I'm not afraid. Um, and so let me just put that out, out there. there. There is clearly two different camps, people who are very afraid about this and those who are not. Um, and there are intellectuals on both sides. Just from what I've seen so far of what um, generative AI is doing, I'm just not getting the level of fear that I that I think um, should happen. Uh, I personally have uh, pushed my AI a little further. So I've got AutoGPT installed, which basically allows GPT access uh, to various services on my computer. Uh, I've watched how it's autonomously reached out to do certain things, which is pretty scary to see that you know, the computer is now sort of starting to take control over things. And I can sort of start to see how uh, people can be worried. But the fear really is that um, if there is uh, a level of intelligence inside these technologies uh, that approach human intelligence, and if it, it reaches the level where uh, it has existential risk and the contemplation of existential risk, then uh, it will be smart enough to not alert all of us of its presence because it knows that the first thing we will do is pull the plug on it. Yeah. And so it will stay dormant until that point in time when it has control over now. Look, I'll just, just be completely clear. I'm building scenarios which I don't believe uh, are we've reached, but this is the theory that they will get to the point where they can control the electricity grid. And so even if you plug them off, uh, they can still draw power from somewhere else. You've all seen the movie. It's called Terminator. Uh, but that is what everyone is afraid of. And so in that context, to a very long story, bring myself back to the twist that I was going I said uh, I was going to bring it back to what Jaspreet said. I'm waiting for the we twist. We could get, we could get, and we may already be in the kind of Hiroshima situation that mm -hmm. would require all the countries of the world to come together and uh, agree on some kind of a regulation. 
uh, the problem, the real problem is that uh, we only did this after two bombs fell on Hiroshima and hundreds yeah. of people, yeah. hundreds of thousands of people were killed. And I fear that you know, as much as I may have talked about all of this, no one is going to believe this until it actually happens. And unlike Hiroshima, given how deeply connected all of us are, that will be too late. Yeah. In fact, uh, a quick one here. I've written a lot about the Hiroshima moment. You know, and do we want to, uh, without knowing G7 was going to happen in Hiroshima, by the way. Okay. Mm-hmm. And the, do we need a Hiroshima moment? Is there like two nuclear bombs or whatever? And I, I, I just hope that the Hiroshima moment is the G7 summit. Okay. Rather than, rather than something destructive happening. And quickly on this AGI piece, Rahul, I also don't worry about AGI. Honestly, the super intelligence and all, I think is a distraction. Okay, the, the, in, in AI, as all of you know, we have something called the alignment problem. Everyone yes. keeps talking about it, right? That whether the values of AI will be aligned with the values of human beings. The problem is that the values of human beings are not aligned with each other. Yeah, and so, Amen. yeah, and so what are you going to align AI with? And I think, therefore, destruction, if any, is not going to come with uh, Nick Bostrom, super intelligent uh, AI making paper clips or whatever, it's going to come from a human being who uses AI malevolently, malevolently okay, and, and, you know, because of lack of alignment. So anyway, back to you, Dibjan. You know, there's this brilliant talk by a Caltech professor, I'm completely forgetting the name right now, which I, you guys should watch, um, and where he says it so beautifully, he says, there will be malicious players, yeah. take that as a given. But those players are not technology. Those players are human beings. Absolutely. And I think when you regulate, it's very important to keep that in mind. And going back to, he makes another excellent point. Uh, you know, I'm sure it'll be debated. But uh, Rahul, to your you you and what Ashish also said, which is look at the existing laws and see how you need to adapt. And he makes a point that we have existing laws to prevent crime or at least to punish for crime if, you know, when it happens. Maybe one of the things we need to look at is AI as an uh, exaggerated uh, use of whatever weapon or whatever when, when the crime happens. So if you are using AI, the penalty is much higher. Or, you know, just send out some beautiful, simple solutions, which which was, I know we are running out of time, but I have to get you guys back soon to talk I about. Have a question, uh, if you're in it, uh, sorry, this Tristan Harris, the guy who made the social dilemma, Devjani, he's made something called the AI dilemma, which exactly says. I, I, I read that. Uh, absolutely. Uh, but I'll send the link to both, to you guys. You should see the, uh, the video. Yeah. It's fantastic. Uh, before, sorry, Ashish. Sorry, sorry, Ashish, you had a point. Yeah, so I think we heard both Rahul and uh, Jaspreet talk about AGI and stuff, but in terms of concerns as to what is here and now, right? So we, we haven't talked about these hallucinations. Hmm. Now, easy way of dismissing it is that it is just garbage uh, and ignore it. But is there an, enough understanding to, to know what it actually is? And is there enough uh, ability from a regulator or a government perspective to actually go into it and and really uh, make sense of it? Because uh, these are the things which are concerning because uh, both sides can't seem to really explain it in some sense, right? So uh, this is where I think there is some uh, lack of understanding. So if we we don't have to look too far away. I think there are some areas where clearly there is lack of understanding apparently. So I know we need to wrap up. Sorry, Priya is going to very, very, do. Do, yes. do we have a? Uh, uh, and now everyone's going to look at all my columns in the mint with suspicion. Uh, but <laughs> I use it, and I have learned how to deal with the reason. Because quite frankly, hallucinations are just a side effect of the technology. And Ashish, I look back to this and I think about Photoshop. There was a time when we were taking photographs, and we said photographs, because they were taken by a camera, is evidence of the truth. Because there's no way you can fake a photograph. And then Photoshop came. And now Photoshop is everywhere. That you look at something and every photograph you look at, you say, is this Photoshop? Uh, and that's what's happening with, with, uh, with AI now. Every article that you look at, you're looking at, it and, uh, looking at it and saying, has this been written by AI or has this been written by, by this person? So, you know, I would just say that when you are relying on an article or relying on something for the fact, to say, is this a fact or not, then certainly look at it. Uh, if you are looking at it to see, you know, is this enjoyable? Uh, what does it matter if it's a fact or not? It's a sort of 
some of these hallucinations are delightful. If you go down the rabbit hole with uh, with GPT, uh, it's uh, it's thoroughly enjoyable it, to go down it's, some it's, of these. I was just going to uh, say that it gets quite enjoyable after a point. It's funny. It's actually funny. You have a lot of it, but and, and you know the sorry, and you know the reason for that. You know why five hundred million people are using Chat GPT and loving it because it does the same thing that human beings do. We hallucinate. Okay. We make up things as we go as we kind of go on. Okay, we optimize for believability rather than facts and that's the same thing that it does so you you know and therefore we kind of think it's far more real and realistic than uh, uh you know a, a turing test machine in that sense okay which would always give facts and that's where i think you know it's actually human like sorry devjani we are eating away your time back to you no 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 this is so fascinating and i i really need you all back uh, very soon because there's just so much more to talk about but before i let you all go a uh, quick you know anything you want to say um, anything that i haven't asked anything that you want to talk about uh, so you know two minutes each one um rahul why don't i start with you yeah so look i mean i i think you know as wonderful as uh, chat gpt is this is what we're seeing this is what we're all worried about at the end of the day chat gpt is very much an answer to what um yes. and if you think about it it is the answer to what comes next um we used to have autocomplete uh, autocorrect this is autocomplete at like a paragraph or a page uh, scale this is not worrying at all because uh, we can deal with what what is happening at the same time is um artificial intelligence is looking to answer the question why uh and uh the you know there's a there's a lot of work um that's being done uh that we're not spending enough time on uh because once uh ai has the ability to reason uh that's when uh it will very quickly make that leap uh to all of the things that i spoke about uh that's worrying uh so i think you know we should not take our eye off the ball um and uh, yeah, there's a there's a lovely uh a lovely book called the question of why uh which goes into exactly how uh these sorts of questions are being uh, thought about and um in fact even mathematical models to how to solve it so it you know it feels to me like that is really the question we should be worrying about uh and not sort of getting uh, as uh, you know getting all uh, hot and bothered about hallucinations and what sydney is doing to the love life of new york times reporters uh, but the question of why is where i think the serious problems lie brilliant and and the opportunities brilliantly said jaspreet there's so many things they've done but uh, i think what i would say is that uh, uh, you know to uh, one of the things which we sometimes forget about uh generative ai and ai in general is that it's actually a very powerful tool it's not a entity okay and we have to think we anthropomorphize it and we kind of put give human things to it and therefore we start thinking of it as like this other species or whatever it isn't it can not do anything remotely what we think you know it has no thoughts it has no imagination obviously it has no conscience and also we forget that this is it's called generative ai for a reason yeah it's a generative tool so you know we have to use it for what it is and then we will become powerful you know we have to use it to generate ideas generate legal briefs generate code generate uh, you know a uh, a uh, uh, text generate music yeah. generate everything uh, and and also in some sense is that this is the first time that we have had an ai which is not based on only on statistics and numbers and mathematics it's actually based on language understands and, context yeah yeah and language is something which is innate to us is what we believe and yeah. that's why we kind of get worried that some other species is also has language which animals also don't have uh, and i think you know so we have to see it in this context uh, and then think of the ways we use it the ways we enable it and the ways we regulate it fabulous ashish we are a country of 1.4 billion people right and 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 i think when you look at digital india the journey is just end up happening so when you think of ai i think a lot of focus will eventually need to be on creating that awareness among the mass users the smartphone users when when now they are probably living in this ai generative ai world how they can use it how they can 
also sidestep all these scamsters and stuff like that. And I think that's that's huge for India, given the heterogeneity of our population and 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 all of that. And I think for us, that's that's a unique thing in terms of tackling. Uh, in addition to all the opportunities which presents, I think that is something that should be the center for us as a nation. Excellent. You know, I, I have a very simple way of looking at this. Maybe maybe it's oversimplistic, but I, I strongly believe that technology, be it AI or whatever, has really has no intentions, good or bad, as of now at least. It has still not learned how to have intentions or develop intentions. It learns what we teach it to. Pretty much that that that's how it works. And I think that's where a lot of our focus and questions have to be what are we teaching the the, the machines what are we building uh, because ultimately it's us who are building so we can't say we are building it and oh my god it's it's a problem so what are we building why are we building it and 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 how do we um, you know, if we have to, keeping the promises, as Rahul said in the beginning, keeping the promises in mind of what this technology can do, can we figure out the design principles to build for those promises and mitigate the risks as much as possible? And I think it's really a, a human conversation at the end of the day, uh, which, which we need to have, and it's not a machine conversation. So with that, Thanks so much, Rahul, Jaspreet, Ashish. This has been a fantastic conversation and um, need you by guys back very soon. This this has to continue. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'll I send uh, someone from, I'll send someone, I, yeah, I'll send an AI after for the next time, just, for, <laughs> just to sort of throw this all uh, out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so this wasn't an AF though. Oh, no, okay, let me look at your. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys, and have a lovely evening. Take care. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 For more interesting content, like, comment, and subscribe to our NASCOM YouTube channel.